I think we uh, were asymptoting at about 29. So I think we'll get we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Welcome to the grad and postdoc scholarly talk series. Um, my name is Darren Lapomi. I'm a professor in nanoengineering and chemical engineering and also faculty director of the IDEA Engineering Student Center. And today uh, I'm hosting a panel on faculty failures. And my guests today are professors Padmini Rangamani and Jesse Jokerst. The Padmini uh, is a professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering here at UCSD. Her research uses computational tools to understand cellular mechanobiology, including cell shape, signaling, and mechanics. She is the recipient of the NIH Director's New Innovator Award and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Jesse is a professor in the departments of nanoengineering and radiology at UCSD. His research area involves the use of nanostructures to augment biomedical imaging and recently new types of chemical sensors integrated with masks for detection of respiratory viruses. He's a recipient also of the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, and I would like to uh, welcome them both here. All right. So, um, just as a uh, as a means of um, interacting with the group here, if at any time you have a question, you can drop it in the chat, and I uh, I will uh, get to it. Um, if not during the uh, the uh, official program, then uh, at the end of the Q and A session. So feel free to ask questions at any time. Okay, so we are talking about faculty failures. Uh, failure can mean a lot of different things. Um, sometimes we perceive something to be a failure. Sometimes uh, we perceive other people to perceive uh, our actions as failures or lack of actions as failures. And I'm wondering, um, Padmini and Jesse, if you have uh, a, a story of failure in academia that you would like to relay to start us off. And I, um, to give you a moment to think, um, I'll just relay some of mine that come to the top of my head. And these are like professional failures. Uh, so when I was applying for jobs, I applied to 28 places and got rejected at 27 of those 28 places. Um, I, every single uh, NSF proposal I submitted between 2014 and 2019 were rejected. That was 11 in a row. Uh, every proposal I submitted anywhere between 2016 and 2018 were rejected. Uh, every manuscript I've ever submitted to Science, Nature, or JAX has been rejected. Um, despite those things, um, I consider myself a very lucky and successful uh, person. So, well, it was success is such as it is. At least I'm at least I'm lucky. So I'm just wondering uh, now that I've uh, now that I've broken the ice and possibly degraded people's opinion of me, <laughs> what, what you have in, uh, in, uh, uh, to, to share with us. So I'm, I'm gonna go next, Jesse, if that's okay. I failed my first PhD attempt there, Darren. Oh, oh my. Well, I started early. <laughs> so one of the reasons I was very excited uh, to, when you asked if I would participate, I was like, oh my God, I can tell all these grad students that, you know, I failed grad school the first time around phenomenally. And um, I don't want to make light of it because uh, what I think we see when we see our faculty colleagues or we see the CVs on the websites, right? You don't see the attempts. And when you're for students and postdocs in the audience and your paper gets rejected, which I guarantee you it will, it becomes this big fat, like everything I'm doing is not working and my career is gonna implode. And so I'm gonna take a few minutes to tell you sort of the story of my last 20 years because no one's actually ever asked me this in the professional setting. So, you know, I'm gonna give you more than you asked for. Like many international students, I came in 2001 to the United States from India. I was born and raised in India and I came on an F1 visa. So, you know, every time someone in this audience has this, like nobody understands, I haven't seen my family in a long time. Some of your faculty members haven't seen their parents in like two plus years either. So we kind of get it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I came to Georgia Tech to do a PhD in chemical engineering. Um, 
And like many people who get into grad school, I was the top of my class. I had the university gold medal, which is, you know, top rank on 3,000 students. So, you know, there, there's like the anti-failure, if you will, right? So and go to Georgia Tech from India. And what a disaster that was, man, looking back. I mean, like, there are so many words that I cannot use in a recorded setting that I would very freely <laughs> use. And there are many reasons for that. I did not know how to select a research program. You see, I, I was very good with coursework. I did not know how to choose groups, advisors, all the things that, there was no mentoring. There was no, I don't even know if there was YouTube or you know, anybody cared or that I had the wherewithal to look for this. So the long story short, is that four years later, I left with a master's. And looking back, it should not have been the case. Many, many other things should have gone in supporting me through that. And if you thought it was going wrong the whole time, it wasn't. <laughs> I had also won the best thesis proposal award from the department. So it was going well until it just like imploded, right? And since this is a public session, I'm not gonna go into it. But what was important was it was not just a sort of professional derailment. I was, as I said, I was on a visa and uh, I had also just recently gotten married. So there was this whole like personal life brewing and it, it's this whole work-life balance that people talk about and so on and so forth. So the reason it took me nine years to get a PhD is because I failed the first attempt of PhD. Right. And it wasn't, the, the CV looks like a very well-designed, articulated, you know, this is, she always knew what she wanted to do kind of thing. And sure, you can read it like that. But, you know, there was a period where no clue what, what I was doing and so on and so forth. And I also had 40 postdoctoral fellowship applications rejected. And the 41st was funded as the chancellor's, UC Berkeley chancellor's postdoctoral. Just saying. And Jesse, your turn. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, I, I also think this is a great topic. I mean, especially in the age of Instagram and social media, like everybody always talks about how great their life is. And I mean, I have colleagues who live blog every single success on LinkedIn. And it's good to hear that every now and then. But yeah, no one live blogs their rejections. And um a lot of times these sorts of panels or these sort of messages has a, have the concept of like, well, I used to fail and now life's good. And I can tell you this is an ongoing thing. Like I still routinely have things that I think are great and don't even get scored and or don't even get sent out to review. And so there's an element of not taking it personally, which is, which takes a lot of time, right? And particularly when you're a new PhD student, like you kind of only have one thing, right? Like you have one project. And like, that is one of the advantages of having, you know, by the time you're a professor, like I've got 15, 20 things going at any time. So at any one point, like, a third of them are being rejected, a third of them are moving forward and the rest are somewhere in between. So like, but, but I totally get it. So I can tell you, I have been, I did not get into UCSD as a graduate student. I applied to be here as a PhD student in chemistry and was rejected. Um, part of the reason is that <clears throat> I got a fourth percentile, not a 96th percentile, a fourth percentile on the SAT chemistry test. Is that the one there? There's like this special. Yeah, the SAT2. Yeah, the ACT2. So it's like the specialized and, um, and I just failed it miserably. Like 96% of everyone else that took it got a better score than me. Um, and to be fair, I had a lot going in my life at that point. Um, and so I don't know how, I'd probably, I don't know, maybe get the fifth percentile if I took it now. Um, but, you know, I've, I've also just had some major um, 
you know, just, just problems in my life that have been very unrelated to professional settings. And we, we all have had our own, like, you know, traumas that are unique to our life. And that's, that's always helped me put professional things into perspective, right? Like, and so how, how important is this relative to, relative to X or Y? And generally the answer is it's, it's not that important, right? Um, so that being said, I mean, I can definitely remember the sting of like my, my, my second paper coming back with all of these horrible comments and like, oh my God, these, um, you know, and, but there is really an element of, of not taking it so personally that, that takes a long time to, to build up. But, um, I think part of it just comes with age too, um, is you've just, you start to get used to being rejected <laughs> and, um, you know, failing at, failing at lots of things. Um, but you know, the one thing that I think I do a pretty good job of, and probably most of my colleagues do too, is, is we keep trying. So like, I fail at like home repair stuff. There's a, I'll tell you, I thought I could install this, um, light in my closet I've, i'm a, like a five out of ten electrician so um you know i'm drilling i'm drill i drilled a hole through my roof <laughs> like what kind of idiot drills a <laughs> hole through their roof me this was like three weeks ago but you know what i figured out how to patch my roof and i'll probably still keep trying to do minor electrical repairs around the house and so i mean that's a class like that's abject failure right trying to install a closet like and ending up ruining your, your ceiling but i'm I'll, I'll i'll keep trying so that's probably another key message <laughs> i was replacing a bathtub nozzle and i had to solder on a new uh a new copper pipe to the to the, the lead piece and uh i had never soldered uh any water pipes before and i ended up blazing a 12 inch <laughs> band of soot of burned plastic along the bathtub and it still leaks <laughs> so, <laughs> um i like this idea of well it's just a fact that as you get uh you know as you get more advanced in your career actually things get harder to get because the competition gets tougher and more intense uh, but as you mentioned jesse um the process of uh of <laughs> the the process of failure um sometimes can be um it, it's like like it, it's like a mutual fund like as you get older there's there are also more opportunities so you're like you're invested in things going well some things going poorly so like naturally things do get harder to get because of the competition pool but you have more pots in the fire as opposed to this one uh this one experiment that may not be working um padmini can failure be a good thing sometimes so I think in the long run, it can be a very good thing. It's my, my own growth has not come from what are perceived as successes. My own growth has come from what are perceived as failures. At the, at the level of uh, my grantsmanship has grown from the grants that were rejected, not those that were funded the first time around, because that's like, oh, this is great. Here's the money. Okay, that, I didn't. The revise and uh, reiterate process is very valuable. Um, my very first research paper was rejected many, many times, and it was, it took, it takes a lot when that's your only project, like Jesse mentioned, to like bring yourself back to the table and open the document and like figure out, like, I didn't even understand what the reviewers were saying. Like, like why, why do you guys all hate it so much? Why do you hate me so much? <laughs> um, but I think that has really pushed me to be intentional with my word choice while writing a sentence or writing an email or writing a Slack message. And I find that those who have actively internalized the intentionality of why they are doing it. So this kind of goes back to something that was mentioned earlier about resilience. 
And it is not something that you're necessarily born with or, you know, you have a support system around you. Yes, if you have all those things, that's maybe makes things locally easier. But I think the intentionality of how to deal with that failure is a very um, important learned skill that that is something I hold much more valuable than I hold the perceived successes. The fact that I know that it is possible to recover even if your PhD implodes allows me to be intentional about how I want to mentor students or select students. I think there's a lot more intentionality that goes into learning from what do I want to do with this failure? Yeah. It's also true that one never gets 100% of those, the things that they never apply for, right? You have to apply in order to get something. And there is a uh, apparently a rule in hospitality administration where you don't want your hotel to have 100% occupancy. You want it to have maybe 95% occupancy because if you have 100% occupancy, you don't know that there's more money to be had on the table. Um, whereas if you're at 95%, you've gotten everyone that's willing to pay that amount. Similarly, in applying for professional opportunities, if you don't fail kind of a lot, then you're probably not taking enough risks. And in that sense, failure might just be evidence that you are making a sufficient number of attempts for eventual uh, success. Jesse, yeah, did you did you want to? No, I think that's a that's a really great way of thinking about it. Um, if you if you if everything's going really swimmingly, you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. Yeah, it's also uh, true. Padmiti mentioned um, mentioned getting feedback like these people hate me, they hate my work, and that is a very often like you know. I recently got some comments from a rejected grant and it took me a week to open up the critiques uh, because I needed some cool off time. Uh, but the critiques themselves, even if you know they un misunderstood this, they didn't read that this was actually in the proposal, you know, such and such or, or paper, um, these critiques and, and on, uh, on publications as well, it's sort of like free consulting because a lot of times these people, um, in order to run their research groups, they need to be generating hundreds of dollars per hour in grant funding. And if they took an hour or two hours to review your, your grant or proposal, that's like maybe $500 that they forewent in order to, to, to grade your, uh, your proposal uh, or paper. Um, so, uh, so Jesse, what, what do you learn from, uh, from failure and how do you get over it. I mean, I think that's a really key point. There's, I mean, I particular, I guess now I think about it more on the, when I try to give a student feedback and they don't listen. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not doing it to you. I'm doing it to help you, right? Like I'm telling you that you're writing is very confusing. And if you use a subject verb object sentence construction, and don't use more than 20 words per sentence and only use one comma per sentence, like these sorts of things that your writing will be better. And when people don't listen, it's just very frustrating because I'm, I'm, I'm doing this to help you. And so a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just say, okay, and then submit them, let them sit them, submit the manuscript and then let the reviewers tell them that this is very confusing and I don't understand what you're trying to say. And then we'll finally, and then I'm like, okay, well now are you willing to rewrite the paper? Um, so, you know, part of failure, the, the real, you know, the question you asked Padmini about like, what can you, what are the pluses of it? Or like, what can you learn from it? I would just say, please try. I mean, and, and I do this myself, like, please try to, to learn from it. And so um, on these, on proposals and grants and stuff of, uh, stuff of that ilk, I mean, part of it's, you know, part of it's just a, 
a numbers game, part of it, as, but particularly in funding, right? I mean, I, I kind of start to look at it as a lottery. And so if 20% get funded, like the, my, my chances go up as I submit more proposals, but clearly better proposals have a better chance. And so, okay, let's generate some more preliminary data. Let's, let's do this, do that. Um, and so yeah, again, trying trying not to take it personally and trying to learn from it, I, th I think is is critical to professional growth. So our discussion so far has focused very much from the faculty perspective, and it makes sense. We are faculty members, uh, but writing grants uh, maybe is something that we do very often, but not something that grad students and postdocs uh, do very often, or at least early on in their uh, in their uh, studies. Um, and maybe they're writing one or two papers uh, a year or every two years. But there are other types of failure that don't sort of qualify as this competitive sort of failure where someone else is beating us to, you know, the funding opportunity or, or the, the paper. Um, and those are like experimental and project related failures. So things originating from having like uh, bad lab hands, or maybe on one day we had bad hands in the lab, um, or maybe dropping dropping the ball on an opportunity, or maybe even a moral failure where we do wrong by somebody, uh, or a, like a like a lazy failure where we wish we did something in a project but we but we didn't. Um, and those are all all other types of, of uh, failures that uh, that are I think are worth considering uh, as well as we continue this discussion. Um, Padmini, uh, your hands up. Um, yeah, I had a I had a thought that occurred to me. Well, two thoughts now. So when Jesse was talking about like trying to come. So in full full disclosure to this audience, I also have two teenagers at home. So there's a little bit of a parallel like life story going on here in the group and at home. So you try very hard as a well-meaning faculty member to protect, to, to transmit that, you know, if you write a sentence year long, it's not as uh, articulate as maybe writing a charter, what, what Jesse said. But sometimes uh, it is an interesting balance of, you know, whether do you transmit the lesson to the next generation or do you let them give them a little bit of room to like make that mistake so it, my own training experience uh, was one where a majority of the reviewers right people anonymous to me let it rip and that is at least in my view looking back to my younger self I, well I wish I wasn't put on the deep end of the pool but it is not always depending on the recipient, it is not always a useful thing sometimes to, to try to protect. I, I think that there is, a, so it is also, it's a two-way street, right? I mean, if you, you have to be willing to listen. Um, but the, the, the layers of, the degrees of failure that Darren, um, you've mentioned, I think they happen every day in every group and every research project in every setting. So I think we, when we magnify sort of failure as like a paper or you know qualifying exam or that presentation that didn't go as well. I do think there are a lot of local things that happen. And I have thought a lot about how one might deal with them to recover, right? How do you recover from, say, I should have communicated to my colleague that this, this buffer or this plate or whatever, some minor thing that would have saved people a lot of time, just an omission that didn't seem. Good. I do think it is very important to own up to it and you know take responsibility, even if it makes you feel very poorly in the moment. There's a lot of growth to be had from that. That's usually hard to recover, you know, even if you have to egg on face, right? And I think that is the intentionality is to recognize that I'm sorry, I overlooked this detail and I shouldn't have done that. And I recognize that it may have cost you one week, one day. I didn't put the code where it was supposed to be and I'm sorry. Please let me know how I can fix it. it goes a very long way in building that recovery, that resilience and that trust. Yeah, I mean, I, 
I've got examples from when I was a postdoc of things like um, leaving temperature sensitive reagents out and like just forgetting to put it back in the refrigerator. And then you have to go to your boss and say, hey, can I buy some more of this really expensive protein? And the boss says, I just bought you really expensive protein. Why do you need more of it? And uh, I ruined it, you know? And, um, and I mean, most people are fairly reasonable. I mean, I, 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 now that I'm on the other end of it, I'm always like, okay, well, if we need more, we need more. Um, but, you know, the, the notion of being transparent, I think is, is very, I mean, and that, that's part of what, how you build a relationship, I think, with, with your mentors is, you know, showing a little bit of vulnerability and vice versa. Like, I feel like that's how I try to, you know, build a little bit of relationship with the people I mentor is by being vulnerable. And um, so, so yeah, but I mean, if, if you're constantly just worried about looking good, <laughs> um, you should probably go into real estate because um, this is not a great industry for always looking good. <laughs> so being uh, vulnerable, there are books on this topic now in the, the late uh, teens and early 20s. Um, and I wonder if, um, if there's some chicness about vulnerability and I've also I've also been on a panel like this and said exactly what you said Jesse and um, had it brought to my attention that there is a gender bias or can be a gender bias in whether or not it's acceptable to be vulnerable with students uh, to uh, let your guard down and to kind of uh, stop projecting the mystique of being a PI, you know, for a time. And I wonder if uh, Padmini or Jesse, you have a comment um, on that. Is it always okay to be vulnerable? You have to know your audience and you build capital over your career. I can afford to be much more vulnerable and transparent and now than I could have afforded to, at least perceived to have been afforded to. I think it's more about my own perception, right? That like when I started as an independent PR, I can talk more freely now about work-life balance, challenges with children at home than I might have felt comfortable as a postdoc trying to juggle picking up kids from daycare and that being seen as me not working long enough and everybody else is staying late and late. Um, it's, it's a capital you build, but We also play a role in sort of mitigating that, right? If our trainees want to come in and be vulnerable, then we have to be conscious about creating an environment where they can come in and be vulnerable, not, not be afraid of whatever uh, demographic nature of that, how we would perceive. So I think it, it, it does go both ways. Um, now I just much more say things to be thinking about them, less filter. The filters disappear very rapidly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would agree with the notion of um, knowing your audience, right? Like, it, I don't know that I would just casually mention to the executive vice chancellor that I wasn't admitted to UCMC <laughs> as a PhD student, you know, <laughs> but, I, you know um, but I would happily, you know, mention that here. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, the gender bias, I don't know that, that I, can speak to it necessarily firsthand, but um, you know, I, I do think probably that our more underrepresented students and, and women are, um, you know, the expectations um, might be not completely always fairly distributed, so. You've both mentioned perception, perception of failure, whether or not a failure is truly a failure. It's a, if it's a failure that uh, that that does not um, correspond with maybe some hard success, or if it's just that our the action or the result of an action doesn't meet with our expectations. And one of the ways in which I've 
found on my best days to avoid the sense of failure is to change, to make my own rules for what constitutes a successful behavior. For example, if I'm giving a talk to some industry partners, and maybe there's a chance that they might fund one part of the research, a success in the when I first started my job might have been if they actually wrote a check, but that's probably only going to happen maybe, you know, one in 20 or one in 30 times. But if the metric for success is I'm going to delight this audience, that's my only goal. Uh, I'm going to teach them about what I've done. Uh, I'm, I'm going to write this manuscript in a way that will, uh, that will teach the referees something that I learned. Uh, or I'm going to write this grant because I really want to learn the topic. And maybe writing a grant is the best way to learn something because there's I'm not taking any classes, right? So I need to figure out my own way to do it. And, uh, and I've, I've actually found that that um, changing my own expectations for what constitutes success can actually mitigate a lot of uh, uh, former what I would normally consider as as a, or previously consider as failures. Um, does, does anyone Jesse, you mentioned uh, before the fact that your uh, Instagram feed or Facebook feed is is full of people, um, colleagues talking about their uh, their successes. Um, so I think it's safe to assume that there's nobody that never fails, although it may seem that <laughs> that way from social media. Um, do, do you? believe it when people say they don't fail? No, I, I mean, I don't think these people are saying that they don't. Frankly, it's boring. I, I, I tend to snooze people where I'm like, I don't need a live feed of a <laughs> paper you publish. Like, this is boring. And I just snooze them. Um, and I, every editorial board appointment you have, I just don't, I just, and so, I mean, yeah, I, I'm to this phase of my life where I, you know, have, I, I I know how I mean I I take it with a grain of salt and so I know these people get their papers rejected too um, but um, yeah I don't know I mean I, I feel like authenticity is in such uh, it's such a rare commodity in this age and so I'm so drawn to authenticity when I find it in in friends, colleagues, people in the community, romantic partners, like it's its the thing that I'm just really drawn to. And part of authenticity is that notion of being vulnerable. And so when I, when I can have a colleague where they're, you know, they're genuinely excited about, you know, hey, let's try this and it may work, it may not, but, but we'll at least try it. I mean, that's what I'm drawn to as opposed to someone who, you know, starts off the meeting with their expertise and their accolades. And so it's fortunately, I mean, I feel like it's very human to be authentic, but the, the, the age we live in and being super guarded and presenting your best face um, kind of takes away from it. And so there's, that's, I think something that's just come with, with age and confidence is the ability to just really be authentic. Ted Meany, any um, comments? Yeah, I was thinking actually a little bit more about what one defines as success from the context of a student, right? So I think if we take a step back again from the writing grants and papers, which now we have so much practice, which we underestimate the role the practice plays in being able to do it fast and take it down to the level of what a student or a postdoc may do on a daily basis. I think running a good experiment is a success. I think making that figure with the labels named and beautiful fonts the first time around so nobody has to ask you what is the y-axis, that is a success. And I think what the authenticity that Jesse speaks to, right, it comes from doing the small tasks taking pleasure in doing the details right so that your paper, your thesis, your Senate exam, they go beautifully. I think we, we have sort of separated these sort of, you know, there is this paper, I'm writing a paper, right? But 
what you're really doing is writing a paragraph or making one bar graph. And I think doing that right is a success. It is so important. I'll make the figures later. I'll do the references later. I think those are all things that kind of come in the way of feeling good about what you've done after having worked very long in the lab. And you know, you can you can reframe one of the beautiful things about academia is you can set your metrics for success. You don't have to compete for everything. Right? After a point, you basically say, I'm going to do this this way. And that works. Yeah. I really like that notion too. And you know, designing the experiment well, I, I think is such a great. I know I felt it in my, like around the fourth year of my PhD when I finally was like, oh, and I need to include this control and that control and this will tell me X, Y, and Z more than if I would have just done it this way. And so now on the other end, I mean, there's nothing that gives me more satisfaction than when I, you know, somebody's presenting in group meeting and I get ready to say, well, where's this control? And then they immediately show it because they did it on their own. And I'm, oh, that's awesome. We, you know, um, so that like, that's such a success. That's such a success. Cause you're just, when, when students start thinking in a more rigorous way. I love that. And we were talking about uh, how, when you get farther along in your career, your successes are like, your, your investments are diversified, like multiple papers and stuff. But even if you're, you know, the number of things you're, you feel like you're doing are relatively sparse, like I'm working on this project, which will lead to one paper, it is possible to make your successes, your opportunities for success more by going more fine grained. Yeah. So if you, you know, this paper, this, uh, this plot, uh, that Padmini mentioned, uh, even interactions with colleagues and lab mates, like I really gave good feedback to my lab mate. I really told my undergraduate mentee that they did a great job and not just flattery, but exactly why they, they did a great job with this, uh, this experiment. Or a postdoc is mentoring you and you say, I appreciate that you, uh, that you took the time on a Saturday or something to teach me this, uh, this um, technique. And that's, that's a way to, to diversify, to get more, <laughs> to level out the, uh, the, the valleys, right? Yeah. Um, Even reading the paper for a journal club and asking a question, it is such a success being able to read something and that is, someone's written and being able to understand it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And even at a seminar, you know, if you're somebody that has a difficult time asking questions in public, uh, getting over that fear, raising your hand and asking the question uh, is a success, you know, for, for the day. Um, that is the that, that's what I had prepared to ask both of you. Uh, at this point, I'd like uh, any of our students and postdocs in the audience to either enter questions in the chat or uh, raise your hand uh, and we can call on you. Um, Darren, and I then, know one is a direct message. If, um, okay. if you had something else, um, did I cut you off? Oh, no, go ahead. Okay, so this was a question about um, would you say that communication of criticism plays a part in how people respond to it? And we could probably do a whole other um, grad talk about communication of uh, criticism. And I, I mean, obviously, yes. Um, and, um, you know, I think one of the main lessons I had to learn when I moved from being a graduate student to being a professor is that you kind of have to treat every grad student slightly differently because they all have different communication styles and different needs in mentoring. And I kind of wanted to treat everybody the same and just have a recipe because that would be easy for me, but um, that's not easiest for the students. And so, yeah, obviously that communication of criticism has to be tailored to, to the student. Can I, can I jump in on that real quick? Um, I agree. I also think that 
on the other hand, if you receive criticism from somebody who has perceived power structure over you again, it is completely possible that it had nothing to do with you. They were just also having a very bad, difficult day or fragmented bandwidth and things like that. So we do our best. I also very much would like to have a one size fits all thing so I don't have to process. Uh, it's, it's easier, but it doesn't work that way. But sometimes the, the modality of communication of criticism may have nothing to do with the recipient or the giver of the criticism, but just very simply the fact that there are very many demands on that same instant of time going on. And there is a certain kindness to giving the other person the benefit of the doubt, I think, which is harder to do if you're at the receiving end of the criticism. Question from the chat by, um, uh, oh, I, I, I won't read the names in, in case, uh, it's, since it's going to be posted publicly. Do you think that there's a hierarchy in failures? Are some I mean, failures my worse failure than- right now, nothing I have done has, you know how many patients have been improved by what I've done? Zero. <laughs> Zero patients have ever been, had lived a minute longer, had one bit less pain, like nothing. And this is after 10 years and 12 million bucks. Nothing, I mean, nothing. And so, you know, just like we're talking about on the lower end of like designing an experiment, like is a complete success. So like, as I've progressed, like my, my goals have become bigger and bigger and bigger. And so like, the next thing I'm looking at now is like, okay, so how can we make a company to actually translate some of this and actually make something that could get FDA approval? And so like, we've got baby steps there. We've got, we've formed a small company. We've raised a little bit of money. And so, but yeah, there's definitely that kind of hierarchy. And so I think that's some, you know, it's very human to wanna to keep trying to push yourself a little bit harder. Yeah, let me get, let me jump in there. Um, so the, the hierarchy, I, it's it's funny you 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 went that direction, Jesse. That's 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 really interesting. Um, I would say that like the hierarchy is like moral or laziness failures, or I just totally drop the ball on a like a personal interaction and I ruin a relationship or or really degrade a a relationship, or I I make like a either an error or an incompleteness like not a not a big deal like kind of that leads to misinterpret misinterpretation of data but something in a paper that i just really regret like not doing that control experiment and it gets like published and uh and the reviewers didn't catch it it probably wouldn't have been that big a deal but like oh it it like stings like years later when i look at that plot and i'm like why didn't we just take the next step or why didn't i take it because usually more often than not i'm talking about something from uh you know my my grad school or or postdoc uh research there are only like you know one or two instances of that but um but it does does exist uh padmini did you want to uh, comment on this question yeah i think there are failures and then there are failures, right? So I'm, I'm gonna give you an even bigger level like response than Jesse, right? Like, I mean, I, I work in cell biology, nothing I do at this point or in the near foreseeable future in my research plans is like looking at disease, right? You know, I'm very happy looking at cell biology and I've come to realize that maybe it would have more impact if I do it that way, but I'm, I'm good at this, I'm enjoying this, I don't want to change course and maybe I'm not, you know, I think that is that, but I, I also want to sort of like uh, share something that my postdoctoral advisor now deceased used to tell me, uh, which was that at the end of the day, what matters is people and how you treat them. And that, that's really all that matters. Much of it is that it's just very simply that, you know, if it's a paper, it's a figure, you can rush it, you can, you can do a lot of things, but at the end of the day, people will remember how you conducted yourself and how you treat them. And, and in the list of hierarchy of failures, I think that's the one to remember. Am I doing the best I can? And am I taking ownership for my actions? 
And that's yeah. hard. That's actually quite hard. <laughs> sure. When when I think about my own research in the lens that Jesse uh, uh, conjured up, um, I think of the fact that in my thin film photovoltaics research, it has undoubtedly released more CO2 into the atmosphere just by doing the research than, uh, than we have actually uh, saved uh, or prevent, <laughs> prevent it from being released. But then I think about the uh, 10 PhD students, um, 13 PhD students plus postdocs who are probably that I've graduated who are probably earning a combined, you know, one and a half million dollars in salary per year and professional and personal flourishing. A lot of times I played a role in helping them find their, uh, their job or starting their company. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a way to create your own, um, metrics for success as, as, uh, as Pedmini mentioned, although um, I do actually hope that I get out of the, the valley of uh, carbon emissions on my, uh, at least my energy research <laughs> at, at some point. Um, another question from the chat, uh, Padmini, how did you decide to continue pursuing the PhD? Oh. The answer to that really goes back to what's going on in your life and what kind of support system you have. To be fair, I had a master's in chemical engineering. You can get a very good job and get paid very well and not have to do this. But there were other external... I have been very fortunate to have champions who believed in me when even I've not believed in myself. And that, that was the big reason. Thanks, Padmini. Um, a question that I received ahead of time, how do you know, uh, for example, when a project or proposal is failing, um, how do you know when to stop submitting that idea or switch topics? That's a great question. Um, some, not every idea, I don't know, not every idea gets funded. Generally, everything is publishable somewhere. <laughs> Bless the proliferation of journals. <laughs> um, I think when you have multiple projects, you, do, you can paste them out, right? You can let some rest uh, if they're not going forward. I, I think those of us who have multiple projects, maybe po senior grad students, postdocs, and faculty have that advantage. Uh, I'm not a good one to answer that question because I recently sent a photo of notes from 2013 on a problem that I wanted solved that I think one of my postdocs and grad student pairs may have been, we may be close to solving. So I don't know, but I should speak to how to let go because I think I kind of never let go even if I don't know how to do it. But <laughs> I think it's a question of the, do you have to do it all now? So I think there is the, there's the long career trajectory and then what do you need to do to meet certain milestones like a Senate exam or a publication? So there are different, Again, right, you can break it up into hierarchy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you both mentioned uh, readjusting the definition of success and failure uh, to not perceive some situations as a way to deal with failure. Are there other methods that you use to cope with failure? How about, um, like just as a, as a person, not necessarily as an academic, like is exercise or meditation, uh, seeing a movie, reading a book, stuff like that. Does eating ice cream and chocolate count? Yeah, <laughs> yes, eating. absolutely. <laughs> Stress eating. <laughs> um, I, I exercise quite a bit. It's actually a thing in my calendar because if it's not on the calendar, then other things will fill in. Um, Hanging out with my family is not, you know, no matter how bad it goes, I'm going home, right, at the end of the day. And uh, as I say this, I know that students are, you know, they've moved from their home locations and they're like trying to figure it out. So I do think it is 
important to sort of have a community, right? Like you can you can stop at the end of the day, you're gonna go grab a beer with friends, maybe not all your friends have to be academic friends. That's the other thing. There's a little bit of a bubble that we tend to do, you know, lab mates, people on our floor. We tend to sort of perpetrate a little bit of the misery. Academics do like complaining a lot. Um, so, you know, hanging out with people who are not academics can give you a, a different perspective on, well, your experiment didn't go well, but maybe somebody else is having a hard time keeping their job sort of thing. So I, I think thinking of like life as a bigger thing can be valuable. Worst case scenario, you know, call some cousin or parent or somebody you haven't called in a long time because you keep saying you will because when you finish the work, right? So I do think it's important to, I watch really like crappy Bollywood movies with my family. <laughs> I subject everybody to the big fat musical show and I feel better after. So there's that. <laughs> Excellent. For me, it's uh, watching old episodes of Star Trek <laughs> in order on Netflix at night. Uh, Jesse? I mean, yeah, I think there's just an element of keeping it in perspective. And um, most of my friends are not academics. And um, yeah, and there's just an element too of embracing being comfortable with mediocrity. So like I have sung with multiple choirs and I'm a really bad singer. I have, I like scuba diving, but I'm, I'm very mediocre at it. I just described how I'm a mediocre electrician. Um, I'm just like mediocre at a lot of things and have, but I, I'm so glad I got to sing with a choir. I'm so glad I got to like, you know, do, do diving or do, you know, these uh, like play botch. I, 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 it's, I don't know. And there's just an element of willing to be, um, to take the risk. And then the other thing I would say is um, being of service in whatever form that looks to you. So I have multiple organizations that I'm involved with that try to help the community and, um, and so there's a way of extending that to thinking about your job as being a service commitment. And um, so when you think about that, and there's nothing like, you know, helping someone else that tends to take the focus off of your problems. It's like one of the oldest tricks in the book of, um, of getting off of your problems is to think about someone else's problems. I think that is a wonderful place to end on. Uh, thank you, Padmini and Jesse, for your time this afternoon. And thank you, everybody in the audience, for your attention. Thank you. Have a good weekend, everybody. Bye.